The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation. Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well-being of older Californians and their caregivers. And by the generous donations of our listeners, including Richard Lewis, Karen Kirkham, Lynn Noyce, Celeste Bernacki, Harry Hahn, Elizabeth Chung, Kathy Foley, Rochelle Bernacki, Christine Ritchie, and Lloyd Wolstack. Let's get on to the show. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Widera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, I'm really excited today. We're going to be talking about hearing loss in geriatrics and in palliative care. And we have two guests with us to talk about this. Two wonderful us? guests. I'm delighted to welcome a friend, a research mentor, a colleague, a donor to Jerry Powell, Meg Walhagen, <laughs> who is professor in the UCSF School of Nursing. Um, she's passionate about hearing issues related to hearing loss. She's a former chair and board member of the Hearing Loss Association of America. Um, welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Meg. Well, thank you very much. Well, it's really interesting being on this side of Jerry Powell rather than the other side looking in. <laughs> And we're delighted to welcome Nick Reed, who is Assistant Professor in Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins University. And he is also a clinical audiologist, which is going to be key for this podcast. Thank you so much for joining us, Nick. Thanks for having me. Super excited. So Nick, before we dive into the topic of hearing loss, do you have a song request for Alex? I do. How about uh, Walk by Foo Fighters? And why'd you pick that song? Yeah, super, super personal song for me, but does have a hearing loss connection. Several years ago, a very close friend of mine uh, passed away from von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, unable to suppress tumors in his body. And the last, the last thing we really did before he really took a turn for the worst was um, we saw a Foo Fighters concert together. Uh, so that band generally reminds me of Scott, but not having tumor suppression at the end of Scott's life, he also due to a tumor sort of pressing up against his internal auditory canal, lost his, some of his hearing. And in those last few months of his life, he wore a pocket talker that I'm sure we'll talk about today, these amplifiers, every single day. And it was sort of his connection to his you know, wife, child, and you know, they would send me pictures and stuff. And this just, this had such a profound movement on me that I actually like tore up a grant and rewrote my entire you know, research line. And you know, so for me, I don't know, hearing and Foo Fighters just, just goes together. So I know, long story, but you know, you asked. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's hear it, Alex. And Dave Grohl, front man for the Foo Fighters yeah. um, and former drummer for Nirvana, uh, who sings this song, has also talked about his own uh, issues with hearing loss. Um, so here we go, a little bit of Walk by the Foo Fighters. A million miles away your signal in the distance to whom it may concern I think I lost my way I'm getting good at starting over every time that I return I'm learning to walk again I've waited long enough Where do I begin? I'm learning to talk again Can't you see I've waited long enough Where do I begin? All right, Nick, who did it better? Oh, Dave clearly, Grohl. Alex. Oh, definitely. No, definitely. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Wow. Um, so I think this is our very first podcast on hearing loss, um, which is shocking. It's such an important geriatrics topic. Although we'll get into this. I don't think it's very much covered by palliative care uh, curriculum. Meg, can I turn to you? How did you get interested in this as a topic, both clinically and from a research perspective? Well, to be honest with you, this was a long time ago. I've been doing some work, uh, actually with the Alameda County State, looking at the data 
and was looking at my own research. I'd been working with persons who had diabetes and also caregivers and so forth, and try to go at the direction and realize as I looked more and more at hearing loss, that it was totally unrecognized in clinical practice. Uh, so I started asking around in terms of even my colleagues and so forth. You know, you read about these little, like you say, paragraphs in books that say something about what you should do with, with hearing loss and testing for hearing loss and making sure hearing aids are in place. And I said, you know, do you know anything about putting hearing aids in place or anything? So it became really so pertinent to me that this was a humongous communication issue and so many older adults just didn't recognize their own hearing loss or didn't acknowledge it. And nurses and other healthcare practitioners knew nothing about it. Um, and so I wanted to see if I couldn't do something from a very clinical perspective. So I totally turned my research into this area at a time actually when it was so underrecognized and very unfunded. Yeah. Was I had to convince nursing that it was even a nursing issue. Thank you, Meg. Nick, how about you? How did you get interested in this from a clinical and a research perspective? Yeah, uh, totally different perspectives too for me. I, honestly, I grew up around hearing aids. My um, my great grandmother in particular had a very profound hearing loss, and I don't know. As a kid, I was obsessed with sort of taking them apart and kind of wanted to do more of the engineering side. And honestly, in undergrad, was like engineering is really hard. I don't like this anymore. And I switched to psychology and linguistics and kind of became this person interested in just speech. And somebody put in my head, you should do audiology because you're interested in hearing. And uh, I was like, I never want to do that. I don't, you know, that I don't see myself in that world. I was actually a program coordinator for a uh, high school at risk youth program in Indianapolis, Indiana. And one of the parts of that was actually doing sort of physicals for the students and putting them in job placements. And mm -hmm we saw hearing loss in a lot of our, uh, you know, a significant number of our kids. Like, you know, we only had like 300 in the program and there's like 10 with hearing loss. And that's not, that doesn't line up at all. And these are at-risk kids, you know, they're struggling in school. And I sort of was like, I'm going to, I want to do something about this. And I went back to school, did audiology. Fast forward, I was doing pediatrics only, basically all day long at Georgetown University. Had a random student fellowship and I ended up at a poster next to Frank Lynn from Hopkins uh, as an otolaryngologist and epidemiology person too. I might have an appointment in geriatrics too. He's one of those superstars here. And he liked some of what I was doing, which was really on diabetes and hearing loss. I was just sort of peripherally interested in it, but he got really interested when I said, yeah, you know, I've read some of your stuff and I'm using these personal sound amplification products, these PSAPs for young adults who are in their mid twenties transitioning off of their parents' insurance, or they're going to college and they no longer qualify for Medicaid as a child. And they, they don't have hearing aids anymore. They grew up with hearing aids and they need something. So that bridging the gap, honestly, he, he offered me a job at a conference because we had posters next to each oh. other. And now, now I focus on age-related hearing loss and just a completely different world. Great story. And let me ask both of you. Um, so this is a podcast going out to geriatricians and palliative care providers. I, I actually I pulled open a textbook on geriatrics that has a whole chapter on hearing loss. I pulled open the same size textbook in palliative care uh, and had a paragraph, small little paragraph that was a combined paragraph on hearing loss and vision. Wait, wait, which which textbook had the small paragraph? I'm not going to mention it. I may have been okay. an author in one of the chapters. Oh, okay, but so the palliative I, care textbook had a small paragraph. Yeah. Palliative <laughs> care one had a <laughs> yeah. very... yeah. Why is this important when caring for... I get why it's important for aging. What about for the, the palliative care listeners out there? Meg, what are your thoughts? Well, you're really addressing a problem that I've been proselytizing about for a long time. How do you have sensitive conversations with people about goals of care if they can't hear you? You think about the ways in which palliative care practitioners are taught to have sensitive conversations, to be sensitive to individuals, and yet it's never raised in terms of addressing hearing loss. But individuals who have hearing loss, I mean, there's several problems. One is many people don't even realize how much of a loss they have. Um, but it's not just a decrease in sound, it's a distortion of sound. And when you think about that, they're hearing pieces of the information and their brain is trying to make sense of it. 
So it's very effortful. It takes It's very tiring when you have hearing loss to try and listen. And you're bound to miss some information. But you're also often left out of the conversation if the person feels that it's taking too much time. They may talk to your partner instead of you. They don't engage in the care. And we've done work with this. And we've got some perspectives on the palliative care practitioners who acknowledge that they may misinterpret the person's cognition. They may think the person is not needing to be engaged or it's going to take too much time. So they leave them alone. So it's a critical component if you really want to have conversations about goals of care. You want to have conversations about the types of treatments that the person wishes to have or doesn't wish to have, um, and to really engage the person in the family uh, in these conversations. And that's true across the spectrum of care, but it becomes increasingly important when you think about people with multiple chronic conditions who really do have to make some of these very difficult conversations and and decisions. And hearing loss is associated with a a bunch of bad outcomes. Is that right? Yeah. Including more hospital utilization or healthcare utilization, mm-hmm. maybe cognitive impairment issues. Is that right, Nick? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the one that gets, you know, all the attention is the dementia part. Yeah. And um, there's multiple uh, survival analyses looking at incident dementia and hearing loss is strong, you know, independently associated with the time to event dementia. But when you put all those together, and this is what the Lancet Commission does, and this is what I think a lot of people take away, and you start to do population level attributable risk for all the modifiable risk factors for dementia and the non-modifiable risk factors, just genetics, and you pull that all out and hearing loss accounts for 9%. So if you, you know, the the easy way to interpret that based off of their models is if you wiped out all the hearing loss in the world, you'd wipe out 9% of dementia. I mean, that assumes a lot, Mm -hmm. but I think that's pretty amazing that of the modifiable risk factors, it's the largest attributable risk, right? Mm -hmm. More than obesity, more than education. That's, you know, that's the one that people pay attention to. But then to your point on the other side, We've seen work that hearing is related to decline in gait speed, uh, Mm -hmm. falls. My own work focuses on hospitalization and health utilization over time. And we see things like over a 10-year period, adults with hearing loss have a 40% higher risk of experiencing a 30-day readmission, 2.5 days longer during uh, duration of hospitalization if they are hospitalized, just spending you know, accounting for everything else under the sun we can think of, including baseline health and utilization metrics, they spend $22,000 more on average over a 10-year period. Just, it's a lot. Uh, Why do you think that is? So I think, I think it's multifactorial. Um, Spoken like a good researcher. Yeah. (laughs) I, you know, you have to say you're necessary. (laughs) My, I think, you know, one, one thing I just, I always acknowledge is, you know, we're never going to capture everything in you know, longitudinal claims data or longitudinal surveys, right? There's tons of people that, you know, you say you adjust for everything, but I'm sure there's other things going on. So there's always a residual confounding, but I think it's very much sort of three pathways and it's not understanding your care and then uh, limiting treatment effectiveness and treatment adherence. I think that there's stress and confusion during care, especially hospitalization leading to delirium, less satisfaction. And then there's a synergistic piece here where when you're not satisfied with your care, you don't seek care in the future. I mean, why, if you're, if you're not satisfied with your care and you're sort of ending up more likely to be readmitted, why would you look for care the next time? And, you know, we've got some work showing that people with hearing loss, they don't worry less about their health or anything like that. But if you ask them questions about, do you seek a doctor when you feel sick or do you disclose certain things to a doctor or do your perceptions of your care absolutely different from other adults the same age? Um, Nothing about their own health. They worry, they, you know, they care about their health, but they don't engage with the healthcare system the same. So I think there's sort of this snowball effect over time and leads to preventable issues. Yeah. I'd like to also bring it back to the personal level in terms of uh, I've had people share with me the issue of how prepared they need to be to go to a practitioner. Well, one, 
I talk to people and they always say the practitioner never asks about their hearing loss or takes it into account unless they have to self-advocate for themselves if they're aware of their hearing loss and they're willing to self-advocate. But on that other level is that it takes so much effort to hear what's going on, especially if you have significant hearing loss. But on the personal level, it's an engagement issue as well. We talk a lot about the issue of cognition, and yes, that's a critical importance. But when you talk to people about relationships, the fact that they're trying to communicate at church or any kind of house of worship or go out to meetings, the fact that people stop going out to events, um, that they restrict what they're doing. I had someone talking about the fact that there were buildings they couldn't go into where they happened to have tinnitus at the same time as the hearing loss, but that they just were very uncomfortable going out to any kind of meals or stuff like that because they couldn't communicate. So they're left out. So while we think about these other things in terms of the cognitive stuff, the relationship stuff, the fact that engagement is so critical is another humongous reason for taking into account hearing loss and paying attention to it, screening for it, which it doesn't occur. Well, how well, how common is hearing loss in, let's say, older <laughs> adults? Or do we know anything even how common is serious illness palliative care populations? Mm. I don't know about that specific population, to be honest with you, but like just taking a big picture. Yeah. Um, you know, if you use uh, NHANES data, National Health uh, Examination Nutrition Survey, so objective data, you, they actually measure hearing with pure tones, the, the clinical gold standard. And if you look at adults, or if you look at, I think, everybody in the country, 20 and older, um, as of like census a few years ago, you get around somewhere between 38 and 40 million Americans with hearing loss. But if you just look at some you know, prevalence by age groups. Once you get over the age of 60, half of all adults have a clinically meaningful hearing loss. Once you get over the age of 70, it's two thirds of all adults. And I'll be honest with you too, you know, if you if you pay attention to these things, which there's no reason for anyone else to pay attention to this, but the World Health Organization has actually changed their criteria for hearing loss. And they've made it, uh, they've lowered the bar. And if you actually look at the numbers now, it's like, you know, we went from two thirds of adults over the age of 70 to like 90 some percent. So, you know, they've, they've redefined hearing loss that it's even more, you know, uh, generous, if you will, the metrics here. So it, you're getting to a point when almost everybody over a certain age just inevitably has hearing loss. Well, that's interesting too. Meg, I'd love your thoughts. 10% don't. Like, what are they doing that I should probably start doing now? <laughs> You mean in Although terms restaurants of restaurants are getting harder, or... harder for me to understand what people are saying. So maybe it's too late. <laughs> you mean what do we need to do to treat it? Or what, what's what's going on with that 10% loss. that are not having any stop, stop listening to Alex Smith play Dave Grohl loudly. <laughs> <laughs> so protect your hearing. Well, there is there there is a genetic component. There are um certainly a lot of environmental factors that go into uh, causing or at least contributing to hearing loss. One thing we've looked at a little bit, but it has not been well studied, is the accumulation of autotoxic medications. I worked with a doctoral student at looking at that in terms of, um, because when we think of autotoxic medications, we usually think of high dose types of medications and certain ones. We certainly know that's true of chemotherapy, that people who are post chemotherapy, again, often unappreciated and, and unscreened is that the, the autotoxic events of the chemotherapy leave them with hearing loss along with even if you know if they survive, which is great, but they have these other neuropathies and hearing loss mm -hmm. along with it. But if you take a lot of the lower dose things around blood pressure medications and other things long term, we don't know enough about how much um, that affects hearing loss. And there is some data that we looked at that suggested, yes, the incidence of hearing loss was greater in persons who had multiple types of drugs, even at lower doses. Um, but people who don't have it, well, you know, one, maybe they didn't go to a lot of loud concerts and so forth. They don't, they didn't have the genetic exposures. Um, it, but, you know, we still don't know. And we do know that hearing loss is associated with a lot of other comorbidities. Nick raised the issue of diabetes, that for sure, and they've even come out with some criteria, but other chronic illnesses that affect cardiovascular system, cardiovascular disease, um, HIV, those kinds of things tend to be 
more commonly associated with hearing loss, which suggests that if you have someone who has that kind of chronic illness, it's especially important to screen for hearing loss. And how do we screen for it? What should I be doing as a clinician? Well, <laughs> I'd be pleased if you even asked about it. Yeah. Well, what do we ask? What's the question? Well, do you have difficulty? You, you, you can ask, do you have difficulty hearing? Um, it's better maybe to also say, has anyone ever told you that you may have difficulty hearing? It's helpful now that we have some other screens to use something. We happen to test the finger rub, which we found if it was standardized to be quite effective. Some people have advocated for the the whisper it again affect by noise but increasingly there are also some apps on the cell phones and so forth that allow you to sort of screen with um, various tones and they are for persons themselves uh, we've been trying to use this um, the who has what's called the hear who which you can do online you know and and test your own hearing and it's using three digits in background noise, which is a pretty good way of testing for hearing loss. And it gives you sort of an idea of how bad your hearing is, if you will. And what's that site? That was from the WHO? Yeah, the WHO. It's called the Hear Who. Okay. We'll have a link to that on our show notes. It's very punny. <laughs> Nick, yeah, right. when, when should we refer to an audiologist? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think... Like, you know, the screening question to me, actually, to back up is a little bit of like, well, well, why are you screening necessarily? Like, and what's your goal here? And I think I think from a practical standpoint, certain things just take too much time. And the self-report questions, you know, we know that people are not good self-reporters, but does that always like, you know, matter as much? And so the one thing I'll say about using self-report is, you know, use a scale, for example. And I actually use the NHANES question directly from that survey. And I use it for a very specific reason, and I'm I'm happy to share it with your audience if you want to put a yeah, link to a, it. What's a survey question? It's uh, I don't remember the exact words, but essentially it's like you know which statement best describes your hearing, and then it's um, uh, excellent, good, a little trouble, uh, moderate trouble, a lot of trouble, and then they they use the term deaf, which some people do identify as deaf, but deaf's more of like a cultural identity, so not uh-huh. a lot of people will take that, but. The point is, is that you give people an out to put themselves on a scale and they'll, they're more likely mm-hmm. if you, if you ask yes, no, do you have hearing loss? Not really, but if they'll put themselves at a good or a little trouble, right. And actually start to give you some indication of where they fall. The other thing about using objective national or a, uh, a nationally representative data set like that, the big things that actually affect how people self-report and, uh, you know, hearing loss, it's men, uh, it, you know, honestly, if you put it all together, you use like a measurement error model, Caucasian older males are the worst self-reporters. They underreport their hearing loss by the furthest degree, whereas actually relatively younger, uh, 60 to 70 year old uh, black females are actually over estimators of hearing loss. And so you can take these things to account and realize that if a, you know, a 90 year old Caucasian male or 90 year old male in general, race actually starts to play out with age at a certain point. If they say they have a little trouble hearing or they say their hearing is good, they probably have hearing loss. Like the odds mm-hmm. are it's there. I mean, it's yeah. you know, when you get to this rate. So I like thinking of it like that. And then your question, what are you doing for? What are you doing it for here? You know, if you're screening in the hospital for, you know, how you want to communicate or screening to improve communication and palliative care, for example, well, then your self-report question, I think, is very meaningful. Uh, you're helping people in that moment in time. But if you're doing it as like an early screener for referring to audiology, you know, the cut point may be different. And you, I think you actually want to ask people more of the kind of questions of how hearing loss is affecting their life. Um, or this is where you want to put them in that, you know, the Hear Who or the Mimi app or the Sonic Cloud app, all hearing test apps. And sort of get people that, you know, talk to them a little about that baseline number and going to audiology for that. Um, like, what is your what is your hearing number to a certain extent, right? Where do you fall on the scale and let that guide things? So this is, this is like a deeper conversation of like getting into hearing aids early matters and things like yeah. that. So I, I think it, I think it's sort of, there's no perfect cup yeah. here. 
I think it's a certain question of like, you know, almost after a certain age, everybody should get a hearing test. Yeah, I think the one thing that I would just add to that, though, and I, I really like the idea of a scale, and we've been trying to look at that in terms of capturing better data in a clinical setting that's fast, that's easy to, to do, but is also putting it in the context of health. I think what what practitioners really need to do is emphasize so much that this is part of healthcare. Uh, so often what I've heard is practitioners discount the hearing loss or say, oh, I've been told I have hearing loss too. And it's, you know, it's sort of that it's implied that somehow, mm-hmm. well, you're older, you're hearing, you know, naturally it's not going to be as good, but why shouldn't it be? And the fact is that it is a health parameter and it is related to so many health mm-hmm. conditions. So valuing hearing loss, making the person understand why hearing loss and hearing in general is so critical to their overall health and well-being. Well, let's talk about what we can do about it. So let's say somebody screens positive. What are some things... I'm going to start with communication <laughs> techniques. I'm going to give each of you three. If you had to choose like the top three things you wished clinicians would do when communicating somebody with somebody with hearing loss, what would those top three things be? That's a good question. Can I, Nick, can I plug... Can I plug my paper from Jack? You can plug. Plug Please away. Plug. <laughs> it's one of the top three. You can do whatever you want. So I I would I will always point people to. So my my entire research line right now is about developing programs to address hearing in the hospital and what we can do about it. And we actually basically just published our training checklist for JAGs. And so we have, I think it's I want to, it's just after COVID started, like maybe like June 2021 or something. And the article is called so addressing post-mask hearing mask era. Yes, this post mask era. Yeah. Addressing hearing loss. Yes, peri mask era. Like, wow, we're a mask. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. It's, it's <laughs> during. Um, and we list here, uh, I think we pulled, yeah, seven communication considerations. We also talk about tech and environment. And I'll only say my favorite ones. I'll let Meg, you, you feel free to chime in. But I think, um, I think that the big one that people don't understand, and I have to get through to everyone, is shouting doesn't help at all. It makes and things. Why is that? Hearing loss is a clarity issue. It's not a volume issue. Right. You use right. you right. lose your hearing at very specific frequencies, high frequencies, but you don't yeah. lose it at low frequencies. And if you can imagine, a, a regular word has multiple frequencies in it. So the low frequency part is still loud to that person and disrupts and distortive. So shouting, not helpful at all. Slow and low. And I, I mean, I literally... Low and low. That's good. I like keep that. Keep it slow. Yeah. And when I say low, I mean when we speak fast and when we sort of get excited, we tend to raise our voices and we get really high pitched and we do this and it makes it worse. Most people don't hear high frequency sounds. And the other one for me uh, is actually, I think relatively simple for people rephrase don't repeat. And I think people forget this, that we get in these like weird feedback loops that make everybody crazy and frustrated. Mm-hmm. Somebody says what, and you say, you know, uh, whatever, get milk and eggs. And they're like, what get milk and eggs. What? Add some, rephrase it. I'm going to go to the store, buy eggs. You know, we're going to have whatever for omelets for breakfast. Rephrasing is the only thing that can help, right? It adds context. It changes the words. If they didn't hear it the first time, it's it's not because they weren't listening. It's because they literally couldn't access the information. Great, Meg. What are your three? Yeah, well, I would also. I just want to echo the fact that the with the loss of that high frequency, it's the consonants. It's what makes sense of the word, which is why people will also say you're mumbling and so forth. And um, I laugh about the third time effect when people's voices go up, and then all of a sudden they're sounding angry. But I would say one is face the person for sure. Make sure they can see your face. Make sure the lighting is not behind you so it washes out your face, but in front so that the, the person can actually see your face. I know that's affected by masks, but even being able to see the expression can be very, very helpful. So facing the person, telling them when you change the topic so that you sort of uh, prepare the person for what they would like you know, to hear for sure. So you're putting um, things in context, kind of going to the... Right. Yeah. You keeping the context. I like the one about rephrasing because I do think that's something that that we overlook. And then, of course, um, I think just in terms of the communication strategies, being really clear 
and asking the person if they understood what you were saying. Make sure that the person sort of almost like the the teach back, but make sure the person did understand and ask them right up front. You know, let me know if you don't hear what I'm saying. Um, you know, I, I want to make sure that you can hear me clearly. And this is a noisy environment or whatever you can sort of put it in context, but making sure and just reflecting on the fact that yeah. you want the person to hear you and checking on that. And where do personal amplification, hearing aids, how, do, how does that all fit into this? And whether we're seeing people in their homes and clinics in the hospital. Can I tell an anecdote here? Yeah. Anecdote um, away. Yeah. I mean, so often on, uh, I'm on palliative care service right now. And so often we get consulted by teams that say, you know, I have this older patient and they're pretty isolated and I think they have dementia. Uh, I wonder if you could um, you know, engage their family in a goals of care discussion. And we go see the patient and they're hard of hearing and we put a pocket talker on them and we start talking with them and then we show the primary team and the primary team says, oh, it's a miracle. you know, <laughs> It's amazing. They don't have dementia. <laughs> and similarly today, we saw a patient in the ICU critically ill, had, had some strokes and primary team was saying, you know, the ICU team was saying, oh, he's inter not interactive, less interactive. Turns out the pocket talker was broken. So, oh. you know, put, use a, a functioning pocket talker and suddenly, whoa, okay, he's answering yes, no appropriately. So, Nick, what's a pocket talker for our audience that don't, doesn't know what that is? So a pocket talker is actually, uh, a pocket talker is to handheld amplifiers as Kleenex is to tissues. It's a certain brand of That's handheld funny. amplifier, um, but we use it ubiquitously. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind though, if you look them up, there's other brands, but a right. pocket talker is essentially just a very basic amplifier. Uh, it uses regular headphones that, you know, plug in just like you would on an old uh, Walkman, Discman or something like that for if you're referencing back to the nineties or eighties or before, I guess, I don't know. Um, uh, it generally though makes all sound louder in a room. So it's a great product for sort of a static listening situation, yeah. very different from hearing aids, which are meant to be more like, you know, moving through dynamic situations. I think um, the one thing that people need to realize about any kind of pocket talker, they do make very, very inexpensive ones. If you want to call them the little personal amplifiers, you have to be really careful because these are not regulated necessarily. And you don't want to put them on with the volume up. You want to make sure the volume is down all the way and put them on and then slowly increase the volume so that you don't sort of blow out somebody's hearing. <laughs> Um, Back to the slow it, and low. Start slow. Right, right, right. Same thing with a pocket talker or a personal amplifier. But they yeah, come we give in all, all of our geriatric of fellows shapes. pocket talker or whatever they're called. <laughs> uh, the non, the more generic pocket talkers at the start of the year. I think we should probably do that with our palliative care fellows too. <laughs> the um, thing is, though, with pocket talkers, I, I mean, I, I know people don't want to hear this, but. There's a certain downside to the pocket talker. We've we've turned them into this like cure all miracle, you know, working pill. But when we talk about hearing loss, we just talked about how it's frequency specific, and the pocket talker doesn't do a great job, even though it has some frequency settings. It doesn't a do a great job. knob on the side often. Yeah, and well, people don't people so people don't do a good job of recognizing frequency. First off, yeah. like if you turn up the bass on a on your car stereo, you notice it. You do the yeah. treble. You, you really have to be looking for trouble, right? Clarity is different from volume. I and think one of the challenges, though, is when somebody is in your clinic or in the hospital, is that they often either their their hearing aids are at home or there's no battery. No, in no, 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 no. You're 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 jumping ahead and you're thinking I'm saying something I'm not. Uh, totally, the pocket talker, 100, phenomenal. But if you give it to someone and think that it cured hearing, you're wrong. The bigger thing and the more important thing is what we talked about a few minutes ago, which is the communication techniques. Uh -huh. They're going to go a million miles further, even if you didn't have a pocket talker, than the pocket talker alone. The pocket talker is what, like, there's a certain level of hearing loss where you have to have amplification, but the vast majority of hearing loss is mild in nature mm -hmm. and has a lot more to do with just being a decent communicator than trying to throw something at people. And this is what I always like, this is so for our research, we find that. If you just use the pocket talker, people rely on it and they start to do things like 
just give it to people and think that it cured hearing. They turn around, they turn their backs when they talk to people. Yeah. If we focus only on the communication, we get a lot better results in the hospital in terms of what people, our patients report. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. That's really interesting, Nick. So can we talk about hearing the, aids? The, we the, only have a couple of minutes yeah. left. But I will say we that solved the, that the problem right the, now. Hearing aids are over the counter. Everybody should have cheap access to them. <laughs> right, Nick? It's no. Done. <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't. Well, are they over the counter? Yeah, I like, I see it. Like, you know, Amazon, you can buy hearing aids now. But then I see like news reports like um, FDA is still like deciding what to do yeah. five years later. So, what's going big, on there? The big picture is there's always been sort of amplifiers out there that paint themselves as hearing aids. And the internet is still the Wild West. So, even though hearing aids were meant to be sold only through very individual practitioners, which is sort of a policy dating back to the you know 60s and 70s, really, uh, when hearing aids were dangerous, truly dangerous in the hands of somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. Um, you know, the internet sort of changed everything. And so, yeah, you could basically get a hearing aid on the internet, or you could go buy one of those unregulated amplifiers that Meg talked about earlier. The OTC Hearing Aid Act is meant to, to a certain extent, get OTC, rid of... OTC, over-the-counter, over-the-counter over the hearing counter. aid act, right? 2017. Over-the-counter hearing aid act. 2017 rider on the FDA bill, bipartisan, wonderful. Uh, it is meant to create a FDA regulated direct to consumer mm-hmm. hearing aid path for mild to moderate hearing loss. Um, so to a certain extent, you're really empowering the word hearing aid as a label. So if you go to a store, those same things that you would see that are amplifiers and call it personal sound amplification products they couldn't call themselves hearing aids, but they could sort of market themselves for hearing, even though they weren't supposed to. It's not hard to get around those kinds of things. But if the word hearing aid is weaponized as a stamp of approval, that's that does give people some minimum you know, trust in what they're buying. Whether it's a cure-all, though, for everybody getting hearing aids suddenly, that's, that's a different story, right? I think it's a good thing. I think it changes competition in the market. I think it changes access points. I think it changes care. I think it changes the entire care model of audiology because it separates the services from the device. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, uh, I would I would argue that you really, for several reasons, you really need good consumer education. We're talking about trying to give input on the appropriateness of labels because if people think this is a cure-all, it's certainly not. People have to know what they're really for, and that's mild to moderate. I'm also still concerned that they're going to be beyond the price range of many individuals who we really wish to target. Because if you're resource poor, you're still not going to invest money in a um, over-the-counter hearing aid. Um, That's not going to be one of your priorities. So maybe it will be something that will be used more by individuals who are fairly tech savvy and able to do the adjustments. But the directions for many of our older adults, they won't be appropriate because one, the hearing loss will be too extreme or too uh, moderate to severe. But the other is that just from a manipulation standpoint, if you have any kind of dexterity problems, you may not be able to work with them. So yes, they certainly could be helpful and may get people into the market, but I'm hoping also that they don't use it and find that they don't like it very much and then just not go to an audiologist or um, you know, follow through and use other strategies to address their hearing loss. But isn't it a step forward? I mean, hearing aids... Like you got six big manufacturers of hearing aids. Uh, it's kind of a monop a five big, five big five, factors. Five, yeah, two of them merged a few years um, ago. They're four thousand five hundred to fourteen hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. You go to the audiologist, they give you the ones that they're working with. It seems like it's ripe for disruption. I mean, even like I'm, I just looked at the Bose hearing aid. They're calling it a hearing aid. Yeah, I figure Bo's nice, like six hundred ninety nine dollars. It's better than five thousand. That's true, but the the fact is that unfortunately, what you're seeing in so many situations is that's a bundled cost. They're pricing their services, and you're paying for the hearing aid along with the service. Uh, there are efforts to unbundle stuff and to have you know exactly what the price of the hearing aid is versus the price of the service. And that can help at least have you understand that it's not necessarily the hearing aid costs all that money, but you're actually paying for the fact that that audiologist is going to be doing all the hearing fitting and so forth. 
what's sad about that is that often because they're needing to have you purchased the hearing aid along with the service is that they don't do the oral rehab. And I think that was what Nick was sort of referring to, too, is that hearing aids are aids. They don't cure the hearing loss. You have to learn to work with them. Your brain has to relearn how to listen. You've got to use them. But you need to also use really good communication strategies along with them and relearn how to do that because often people have had hearing loss for quite some time before they even go to get hearing aids or other kinds of services. I think the thing is, like, well, part of this, though, is that, yes, in the immediate future, disruption is sometimes rough. Uh, and I, th- I do actually, I, I have worries, right? I don't think this is a cure-all. I think there's many more things we need to do. Right. Um, I actually worry about our Medicaid population. When things go over the counter, Medicaid doesn't exactly want to cover it anymore, right? It suddenly changes the model. Mm. Um, So something that used to be covered by Medicaid, even though it's cheaper on the open market, may suddenly not be covered by Medicaid. And that's not something people are going to access, right? But in general, to to your point, Eric, it's, it's it's, it's a disruption where the current model is very low volume, high cost, integrated, you know, you almost have a gatekeeper model. If they, people think I'm saying that negatively. I'm not. It's just the model of care. I love the idea of getting hearing aids separated from me as an audiologist, because right now, the only thing anyone sees is that $4,700, whether bundled or not, they darn well don't see my services. They see the cost of a hearing aid and they think I'm just some separate sort of car salesman. But in reality, I'm a mechanic and a mechanic is a great thing to have, a good mechanic, right? Everybody wants a good mechanic. Everybody forgets about their car salesman. I don't want to be seen as the person who sold you a hearing aid and that's all I'm associated with. I want to be seen for my skill set. And so when we separate the uh, device from the services and make them separate unbundled purchases, not a bad thing. And this sort of disrupts the entire flow, right? We get new competition and like Bose may be expensive, but Bose won't be the only one to get involved. Some people will jump in and be at a different price point. I guarantee there'll be a more expensive ones. There's always people who are gonna buy Lexus. And over time, when you align and realign this device with the consumer, you don't have someone in between anymore, right? This changes what the companies make and do. So hearing aids right now, it, you know, it's it's somewhat of a false logic when we apply current hearing care models to OTC, because the OTC devices won't look necessarily and always be the same as current models. Right now, a hearing aid company they advertise to me because I choose the hearing aid, right? They want they advertise the audiologists. You flip the switch, you get rid of that person, and suddenly the hearing aid companies are making things for someone in the end. And we might see some crazy innovation actually that works for older adults, right? Like we may see almost like a flip back to devices that are easier for people with uh, uh, finger numbness or uh, dexterity issues. They're easy to put in. I I love these concepts of where we can go, but please don't get me wrong. I do think there it will be a rough picture for some people, and I do think in the immediate future it's going to be hard, right? I, it's not easy, but change is never easy, and sometimes it's a good thing to you know kick up a system that uh, has basically been operating the same way since the 1940s and 50s when audiology was sort of founded. Mm. And since the, was it 70s when Medicare legislation came to be and they explicitly prohibited inclusion right. of uh, hearing aids and coverage from uh, under Medicare yeah. policy, right? So Alex, I think, I'll be honest with you, if I, you know, it, I'm very biased here, but my personal thing is that OTC hearing aids are never going to fully succeed like the whole concept of it until we get Medicare coverage for the audiologist and you have sort of this services are covered. You have like sort of, you have a world where, and and I don't mean like just hearing aid coverage under Medicare. I literally mean like cover audiology services. People can go buy a hearing aid on the open market. Let that, let that do its sort of thing, but build in safety nets for Medicaid and build in services. You can go to an audiologist four times a year, for example, they can help you with whatever product you bought. Right. You buy it on the shelf at Walmart. Great. Bring it to me. Again, I know people hate it. They hate the mechanic and car analogy, but cool. You bought a Lexus. You don't need me. Sure. You bought a Hyundai. I drive a Hyundai accent. No offense to Hyundai, but I need a good mechanic. Harry Pal is sponsored by Hyundai. <laughs> <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> okay. We're, we're, we're wrapping up. I just have, a, I have a lightning round question. Um, 
two of them actually. I don't know if Alex does. Um, I've seen, you know, I mainly see people in the hospital. But I also sometimes like see them as outside of the hospital, and um, like they're putting in their hearing aids. It doesn't seem to be working. We finally give up. We put on the pocket talker. Is there a way to figure out whether or not, like, how long do the batteries last, and how do you figure out if the if they're actually on, especially in people with some cognitive issues, they're not. A, they're kind of fumbling. Well, the batteries actually don't necessarily last all that long, and it depends on what the hearing aid is doing. Because, uh-huh. like, if it's using Bluetooth, if it's using it, eats batteries faster. On average, um, like one or two weeks, or less than that. Yeah. Well, it's not even that long at, at times, depending again on how well they're used. Uh-huh. But and probably Nick has some other ideas about how it is. But one of the things you can sort of turn it out and hold it in your hand and just see if it squeals, partly because of the feedback. So like bring, it, bring them together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or just put it in your hand so that it gets the feedback in the hearing aid and you'll hear it squeal if it's working. Um, it may be clogged with wax. I mean, yeah. that's one of the not uncommon factors to, to do. Um, and checking to make sure the battery's in place. And as you obviously asking, uh, of mm-hmm. course, that assumes they're bringing new batteries with them. Great. Next lightning round question for me. Cochlear implants, we can have a whole nother discussion. Anything I should know as a clinician when caring for somebody with a cochlear implant? Well, it depends on whether it then again, I'm sure Nick will comment on this, but the issue is that if it's one-sided, usually right now they are changing the strategies, but that little tiny wire goes right into the cochlea and it tends to destroy the hair cells that are there which means that when you take that cochlear implant off, the person can't hear. So they take them off at night or whatever. The person is basically unable to hear at all. They may have a hearing aid in the other ear, and sometimes they have bilateral cochlear implants. But it also just to to sort of know is that the person themselves, when you're thinking about it, is that they have to learn a whole new way of listening because they're not using their hair cells. This is an electrical stimuli of the nerve. So the person who gets them has to relearn how to hear with this new type of sound. Um, And you have to work at it for sure. Very difficult, very difficult uphill process. You know, if you're, if you, if you happen to know when your patient got their cochlear implants and it's not been like over a year, even, or even a few years out, they may still be in the throes of sort of that rehab period, or, or they may have peaked there, to be honest with you. It's not easy for older adults to necessarily get used to the cochlear implant. It really is a totally different listening. Right. I want to thank both of you for joining us. But before we end, we're going to actually turn to Alex for a little bit more Food Fighters. Do you remember the days we built these paper mountains and sat and watched them burn? I think I found my place Can't you feel it growing stronger Little conquerors I'm learning to walk again I believe I've waited long enough Where do I begin? Enough. Where do I begin? Wow. That was awesome. Hopefully nobody lost hearing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, Meg and Nick, big thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much for your interest in hearing loss. Thank you so much. And we're also going to have in our show notes, we're going to have articles, uh, links to the articles that we referenced here including uh, Nick's new JAGS article that's coming out on uh, over-the-counter hearing aids. And also, um, where was the one about the hospital? Uh, also, JAGS, um, addressing hearing loss, I, I think like during the COVID-19 pan- pandemic. I can't remember my own title. I'm sorry. <laughs> Great. We all have links to that too. Uh, and with that, uh, big thank you, Artstone Foundation, for your continued support and to all of our listeners. 
We'd also like to thank the generous support from our listeners who've donated $250 or more to the Jerry Pal podcast, including Meg Walhagen, Thomas Quinn, Rochelle Bernacki, Louise Aronson, James Tulski, Arden O'Donnell, Mike Steinman, Marianne Forcia, Ashok Krishnaswamy, Nancy Lunderberg, Gail Cooney, David Schiffling, Cheryl Phillips, Jessica Ng, Harry Hahn, Elizabeth Chung, Kathy Foley, Rochelle Bernacki, Christine Ritchie, and Lloyd Woolstadt. Thank you very much.